of my messages, uh, Jesus is famous, Jesus' famous last words. His last words, okay? I want you, we want revival, right? We want revival. And what Jesus said when he was on the cross, I think it's important for us to understand what he said on the cross is important for us because if we can get this tonight, we will have revival. We will have revival. And so as leaders and pastors and everyone here, if you're saved, you're considered a leader. Okay, God has called you. You're a leader. And what happens in our life is that we begin, you know, to go through life and we get hurt. You know, sometimes, you know, our hearts begin to get hard. You know, we're in ministry and we're helping people. and These are people that we care about. And, 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 and what happens, we get hurt so much that a lot of times what happens is we put our guard up. And so like I, like I, was, like I was saying, God was saying, enjoy this relationship. Like, put your guard down, Valentino. Like, don't worry about it. Just enjoy the relationship. And I think this happens a lot of times with us in leadership and in ministry, period. We get hurt and we put our guard up so much that we miss out on relationships. Come on, we miss out on what God wants to do in relationships. And so what I want to do tonight is I want you to really lean in and see what, what the Lord says when he's on the cross. Because I believe that this can change your life. Because Jesus created a culture as he's hanging on a cross. See, Jesus came on a rescue mission. Can I get an amen? Yeah. He wants us to have revival. He came to save mankind. He's going to give it to us. Jesus gives us eternal life. See, Jesus came to set the captives free. Come on, he's, he, he came to open the eyes of the blind. This guy that was blind today, was he was welding my, my, uh, my, my fence, and this guy's still using here and there, he says, and all this. He's blind. Jesus came for that man. Jesus came for you. He came for me. Can I get an amen? And it all points to the cross. It all points to Jesus on the cross. And what Jesus did on the cross, what he did, is he began to show his power. He began to show his authority. He sets the example for you and for me. He sets, he sets the captives free. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. It's all because of the cross, and it's still happening today. The finished work of Jesus Christ is still setting mankind free. And Jesus is on the cross. I want you to picture this for a minute. He's hanging on the cross, and what he's about to do is going to change the world. I'm sure that if you and I were on the cross, let's keep it real tonight, we would be crying, we would be cussing, we would be screaming, we would be cursing. See, you can hide a lot of your junk and my junk most of the time, but when you're nailed to the cross, it's a different story. You know, people get a flat tire and they lose their mind. You with me tonight? People stub their toe in the middle of the night. I don't care how holy you think you are, you begin to cuss. Come on. You, you, get, you get an unexpected bill and you fall apart. Oh, my gosh, I got this bill. I didn't expect this bill. And you begin to crumble. I know men that when your wife asks you a question, you blow your testimony. She's just asking you a question. We got to understand, men, look, real quick before I get into it. Men, we, we, women are wired different than us. They are going to ask you questions, and they want answers, and you don't got to get mad about it. Come on, somebody. It's just a question. Who are you talking to? Who are you texting? Come on, where are you going? It's not a big deal. Just answer the question. Once husbands begin to understand that, let me tell you something. Your life will be a lot better. Am I right, women? Come on. Come on. So I want you to imagine Jesus. He's on the cross. He's in extreme pain. And chances are what's underneath when somebody is nailed to the cross is going to begin to come out. See, when you got nails on your wrists and nails on your feet... And every breath that you take could possibly be your last breath. It's not easy to maintain holiness. And I'm sure when he's on the cross, these people are wondering, I wonder if this man, as he's preaching on the mountaintops, is going to be able to keep his testimony. 
But notice what Jesus said when he's on the cross. I want you to lean in. I want you to see this. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What does this teach us? This teaches us that you and I need to forgive. See, the Roman soldiers, they begin to tear his clothes off. They begin to tear his coat, his, all his clothes off. And you would say, well, what value is that? But the Roman soldiers, often what they would do is they would take the clothes off of people or whatever they had, and they would begin to cast lots or begin to gamble for it. And Jesus was hanging on the cross, and Jesus looks down on them and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I want you to notice something about this. I want you to notice that they weren't asking for forgiveness. They could care less. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They didn't want forgiveness. They weren't asking for it. They didn't deserve forgiveness. But Jesus is forgiving them, and he's setting the example for you and for me to forgive. If you want revival in your life, if we want revival in our cities... I'm telling you right now, we need to forgive. See, Jesus Christ is the forgiveness of sins. Can I keep it real tonight? Your greatest obstacle, my greatest obstacle that you and I will face in our life is unforgiveness. Forgiveness will get your potential that you have for your life. And it will destroy your potential. It will destroy your relationships. Unforgiveness will destroy more things than anything else. And Jesus is on the cross. And he looks down at the Roman soldiers. And he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus begins to set the example of forgiveness. See, once you and I receive forgiveness from Jesus, we've entered into a culture of forgiveness. And not only do you and I receive forgiveness, but now you and I are able to give forgiveness. See, this is the example that Jesus left for you and for, I, for me. That these people don't deserve forgiveness. These people aren't asking for forgiveness. But Jesus is giving forgiveness. Even though they weren't asking for it, even though they weren't deserving of it, Jesus is still giving them forgiveness. I can't tell you how many marriages I've seen destroyed. All because a spouse will not forgive. They won't let go of the offense. They won't let go of the hurt. They continue to lash out. They continue to keep records of wrongs and keep bringing up the past over and over and over again. There's no love because of the unforgiveness that's in this marriage. And you begin to see the marriage crumble. The Bible says if you keep records of wrongs, that's not love. That if you continue to bringing up the past all the time, that's not love. And that if you're doing that, you're not operating in love. And then what happens when we don't forgive, you and I begin to live a life of bitterness. Come on, you've seen people that have been saved a long time, but they're living in bitterness. They're living in disappointment. You can tell right away what's going on. You know why? Because everything they talk about is negative. The root of it is re really deep down inside of their heart because they didn't have it let go of the forgiveness, the unforgiveness. There's a quote that I, that I wrote down. It's on the screen. It says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free. And the prisoner was you. That kept me using for so many years. That kept me on the streets so many years. All these schools that I went to year after year. I was a new kid all the time. I was eating lunch by myself all the time. You know what that does to somebody in junior high? In high school, you're the new person now. And all these other kids grew up with everybody else. And you're, you become a chameleon. 
I was so mad and so angry. I was so bitter. I didn't know why. I didn't know what. I, I had so much hope before that. As a kid, I grew up. I didn't. I didn't want to grow up with all this bitterness. I wasn't. It wasn't a little kid thinking, "Wow, when I get older, I'm gonna have bitterness and anger." It just happened. I just began to be that person. I couldn't let go of it. I didn't even know who I was. I would go from Cyprus, this guy, from, from, to, to, to Pico Rivera, this guy, to, to Westminster, this guy. I would fit in. And what I happened when I got out, I didn't know who I was. I had no idea who I was. There were so many layers of a different person in front of me. I didn't even know who the real person was inside. It wasn't until I came to Christ Christ began to discover, he began to unwrap all these layers of other people, all these other things, and all these expectations of all these other people. I began to find out who I was inside of me. See, unforgiveness will ruin your life. We live in a fallen world, people. There's going to be people that are going to hurt you. You know why people hurt you? Because they're people. You know why people will wrong you? Because they're people. People are sinful. People make mistakes. In this life, you need to understand, and you need to, the faster you understand that life is hard, the easier it will get. You need to understand that people will hurt you. People will wrong you. People will violate you. And it's your job and my job to forgive. Before they ask for it, before they deserve it, which is the hardest thing to do because we can be waiting. I'm not going to forgive until they say sorry. There's times they'll never say sorry. See, forgiveness isn't something that just comes out of the mouth. Forgiveness is something that happens inside of the heart. It takes place deep inside of the heart. And you need to understand something. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Hello. Well, my feelings got hurt. Well, welcome to the club. I'm, I'm, well, my, my feelings. If it's about your feelings, what's going to happen is you're going to die with bitterness. Every time I do a funeral, I walk around and I look at headstones and I look at years when they were alive and when they died. When they were alive and when they died, I, look, I walk around and sometimes I have a picture and there's a young person there. And sometimes there's an older person there. Sometimes there's couples. And I look and I wonder how many of these people are buried here that never let go of forgiveness? How many people never reached their potential that were inside, the, they're in the ground now. They never reached their potential because they never submitted to the Lord and never allowed God to work on their hearts. See, feelings of anger and all these things, all these things, they will lie to you and they'll keep you bitter and they'll keep you twisted up. See, Jesus didn't feel like forgiving. He's on the cross. He's he's in extreme pain, but yet he forgave. He forgave because it's the right thing to do. Whether he felt like it or he didn't feel like it, he forgave. You and I have a choice. So we forgive or we don't forgive. We have a choice to do it or not. Even if they're asking for it, if they're deserving of it, it doesn't matter. We forgive. If you feel rage and anger in your life, you feel like life did you wrong. You feel like life shorted you up. That means you're a prisoner. That you're allowing unforgiveness to destroy you. And what the Lord is asking of us is to take a step of faith, whether we're asking of it or they're they're deserving of it. See, what God wants us to do, he wants us to forgive. So we take a step of faith and trust in the Lord and know that he's going to take care of it. See, God is a just God. And what you and I don't need to do is we don't need to blast each other on social media. Can I get an amen? Because somebody hurts our feelings. We are Christians. We're men and women of God. People are watching us. And are we bringing them to the Lord or are we pushing them away? And if we're pushing people away, guess what? You and I will be held responsible for that. 
The cross is the most powerful symbol of God's justice. Romans chapter 3 says, all have sinned and fallen short. And the wages of sin is death. So God doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't look at failures and go, well, oh, well, that's not really that bad. No, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So what God does is he sends himself down. He comes to earth. He picks up the cross. He takes on all of our sins. He absorbs all of our mistakes, all of our sins upon himself. He takes the full blown uh, uh, of all our mistakes and judgment. He takes the full impact of our sins. And he died for our, in our place. See, God is a perfect God. And he's a just God. So when you forgive somebody, even though they did something horrible to you, I'm not trying to say that horrible things don't happen to people because they do. I'm not trying to minimize that one bit. I get it. Even though people did something horrible to you, that it was terrible, that it was wrong, it was unacceptable what they did to you. Forgiveness is an act of faith. Understanding that God will, be ju God will bring justice. To what they did to you. But what God wants us to do. Is he wants us to trust him. He wants us to live free. He came to set the captives free. And when you have unforgiveness in your heart. What it does is it keeps you prisoner. So my job is not to get revenge. My job is to trust God. The Bible says that vengeance belongs to God. And one thing that you and I need to do. We need to understand. Is that we don't need to continue to take the abuse it's important for you and I to set boundaries come on somebody we set boundaries that's okay to set boundaries whenever you set boundaries guess what the person that you're setting boundaries with will push back oh yeah now you're gonna do all that oh you're being like that now because you set boundaries at all you're always gonna get pushed back but you set boundaries it's okay to set boundaries I'm, I'm not saying not to do that but you need to begin to forgive don't be a prisoner. Begin to forgive. If we want revival, I'm telling you this is important. We need to forgive. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's showing the example for you and for me. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. See, Jesus is full of grace. See, there's two, two, Jesus is hanging on the cross and there's two thieves on both sides of him. They're both of them are crucified. The one on the left is screaming at Jesus. He's yelling at Jesus in Luke chapter 23, verse 39. It says, if you're the son of God, save yourself and save us. In verse 40 says, but the other cr criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly. And we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man did nothing wrong. And the Bible says that he turns to Jesus and he says these words in verse 42. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What is this man doing? This man is asking for grace. You and I need to ask for grace. Have you asked for grace? Like, have you really, like, just came broken to the Lord and said, God, I'm messed up. Like, I don't got it all together. Like, I, I, got, I got issues, Lord. Like, I've been hurt. I've been robbed. I've been, I've been taken advantage of, God, but God, I, 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 need, I need healing, Lord. This man is hanging on the cross, and he's asking Jesus for grace. And if that doesn't blow your mind, something spiritually is wrong. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus gives grace. I want you to think about what's going on. Jesus is on the cross. He's saving the world. He's saving mankind. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. He's the, the, the lamb that was slain. 
He was the perfect lamb. He absorbed all the judgment, all the sin upon himself. This is a big, huge job in this moment. And then there's this guy over here on the other side. While Jesus is saving the world, Jesus stops and gives him grace. Jesus is in the middle of his pain. He's in the middle of the crucifixion. He's dying on the cross, yet he establishes for you and for me the example of grace. He had enough grace for this guy that was right next to him as he's saving the world. And if Jesus could forgive this guy, how much more would the Lord want us to forgive others? Will you and I get hurt? We get stepped on. Come on, somebody. And if we don't deal with it as Christians, brothers and sisters, we begin to get judgmental. We begin to point fingers when you got three more pointing at you. But you got, you're beginning to point fingers because you haven't dealt with it. Can I get an amen? You begin to backbite. Come on, I want you to picture that. Backbite. Come on, somebody. You begin to backbite. You begin to point fingers. You begin to shake your head like, man, you know what? Because they're sinning different than you are. We become old wineskins. We become bitter and negative, and we're saved to the bone. We're going to heaven, yeah, but we're living in a prison, and we're living in negativity. So the question that I have for you tonight is can you minister to others while you're hurting? One of the most important things you and I will do in our lives is to minister to people while we're hurting. I've seen some of the greatest testimonies of people going through the fire, yet they're ministering to other people. So powerful. I don't have this in my notes or anything, but Lori, I remember when your husband passed away. We were right there with her the whole way, but yet, Pastor, I want to serve. I want to serve in the children's ministry. But Lord, your husband just passed away. I, I want to serve. Lord's been serving in the children's ministry since that time, nonstop, faithful. One of the most amazing testimonies that you and I can have is when we're going through it, we minister to other people. We help other people. Jesus is being crucified. He's got a, a, a crown of thorns pushed down into his head. They, they, they pushed him down into his skull. His back is bare. It's beaten raw. He's got nails going through his feet and his wrists, yet he's still pouring out grace and he's still, in, still giving forgiveness. So can you minister to others when you're going through the heat, when you're going through the pain? Can you minister to other people when someone has hurt you and somebody has wronged you? Can you minister to others when you're going through the darkest trials of your life? You're going to see this throughout the Bible, all over the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. See, when we're going through the heat, we're going through the fire, this is when God's power begins to fill us and we're able to minister to other people. I think of Job. Man, how Job did not go off on his friends. Man, he's a better man than me. I would have went off. Sorry. I would have went off and I would have closed the church. I would have blew my testimony. I already know. Because Job has these three friends, right? And Job lost his business. Job lost his cattle. Job lost, Job lost all his livestock. He, he lost all his property. And he has this party for his family. And the storm comes and the house falls. And all ten of his kids die. I want you to imagine this for a minute. He's digging the grave for ten of his kids. His wife is crying. They're devastated. They've been through a lot. There are pain everywhere going on. and all their Everything is gone. And he's got these three friends, supposed friends. And they say, Job, the reason why this is happening is because you sinned. 
Job is trying to grieve for his family, and they're accusing him of sinning. They're saying, Job, because well, you must have done something, Job, because of all this, you must have sinned. Have you ever noticed in your life that so many wicked people, nothing happens to them? <laughs> I'm talking wicked people. Wicked people, they get to see their grandkids, their great-grandkids. They get to see their grandkids grow old. And they don't want anything to do with God. Zero. They, these people don't want anything to do with God, yet, yet you see something, and it looks like they're being blessed, right? You know what I'm ta talking about. But watch this. Job is like this. Job is like, it has nothing to do with sin. And his friends are like, yeah, yeah, it has to be. You have to have done something wrong. You want to know the truth of what happened? It wasn't because of sin. Satan attacked Job because of his righteousness. Because the enemy does not play fair. The enemy plays dirty. Can I get an amen? But the Bible tells us at the end what happens. And Job begins to minister to his friends. God tells Job, Job, what your friends are telling you is not right. What your friends are saying about me, that's completely wrong, Job. And then God tells Job something very interesting, and I'm going to show you here in a minute in the scripture. God tells Job, Job, I want you to pray for your friends. And Job's like, seriously? you got to be kidding me, right? Like, you want me to pray for these guys? God's like, yeah, I want you to pray for them. Job, a righteous man, going through the heat, going through the fire, obedient. Job chapter 42, verse 10 says, after Job had prayed for his friends. What does this teach us? This teaches us that you and I need to pray for those who have hurt us. I was hurt as a kid. I honor my mom and my dad, okay? I honor them, and I love my parents, but I got hurt as a kid. Things happened to me that wasn't fair, that I felt. My mom and dad got divorced at 10 years old. Totally shattered my life. Totally set me on a course of bitterness. I, 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 I got stuck in using. I was using for years. I couldn't let go of it. I mean, I'm not talking about once in a while. I'm talking about every single day. That was my life. Every day. All day. That's, that's all I did. So I get clean, and I meet this man of God, and he says, you need to pray for that hurt. I tried everything else. I tried AA. I tried NA. I tried, I tried it all. I tried it all. I, I, I mean, I've been to rehab after rehab after rehab after rehab. Men's home after men's home. I, I did, I, but I never let go of the unforgiveness. He goes, I want, you to write the, I want you to write it down. We're going to talk about it. I begin to write it down, and I begin to pray about it. I haven't got loaded since. Can I get an amen? But God tells Job, Job, you need to pray for your friends. Job is grieving. Job is full of hurt. They're accusing him. There's condemnation. Notice what happens. Verse 10 says, after Job had prayed for his friends, notice what it says. It says, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Verse 12 says, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Verse 16 says, after this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. This is only possible when you're able to minister to others through your pain. God began to give him grace, and Job began to give grace to other people, even though he was still hurting and still in pain. See, Jesus gives us the example Luke chapter 23, verse 43 says, I tell you today, you'll be with, me, be with me in paradise. What Jesus is showing us is that he's giving grace. But can you and I do the same thing? This 
This is important, church. Listen. If you want revival, you want real revival, you got to give grace. To those that don't deserve it. Those that have violated you. Those that have hurt you. And the reason why I share this with you tonight, everyone here, left or right, back and forth, everybody around, I want you to be blessed. I want you to be blessed. I want there to be favor in your life. You need to pray for those people that have hurt you and begin to give grace. What this requires from you and from me is faith. Because see, what Jesus did on the cross, he shows us the example because the culture that Jesus gave you and I as a church is to live in faith. Matthew chapter 27 verse 46 says, about, the three, in, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cries out, uh, cries out in a loud voice and says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachi, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A chapter before that, Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, says, Do you think I cannot call my father? And he will at once dispose more than 12 legions of angels? What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I've got the power to call down as many angels to destroy the Roman army. He can wipe out the Roman army like that. This is the kind of power that Jesus has. This is the kind of credibility that Jesus has. He's on the cross. And for the first time in his life, he's separated from the Father. God has placed the sins of the world on Jesus. He set the sins of him on him. And God, who is perfect, who is flawless, has no choice but to turn his back while Jesus Absorbs all the sins. This is really important because the reason that this happened was so that you and I, the Father will never turn his back on you or me. Jesus took it for us. So on that day, when you go to heaven, you will be accepted because you're covered in the blood of the Lamb. Are you with me today? Jesus in his darkest moments separated from the Father. This is why you and I need to repent. This is why you and I can't play games. If I don't repent, let's just close the doors and be done with it. <laughs> what am I doing up here? I'm not no better than nobody else. I got to ask God, God, forgive me for my attitude. Forgive me for, for, for my things that I'm thinking that come out of nowhere. I'm like, what is, what is this thought I just had? It's repulsive. God, forgive me. God, wash me. And what he does is he begins to wash you. God, I, I had this bitterness towards somebody. Lord, Lord, take it away from me, God. I pray, God, that, 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 that they'll be blessed, Lord. But help me, Lord, with this unforgiveness. Jesus stays on the cross. I'm done. I'm done. Jesus stays on the cross. Literally, he remains on the cross. He doesn't call the angels, the legions of angels, to set him off the cross. He literally hangs in there. See, faith is living in the why. He says, why have you forsaken me? See, faith is living in the why, even though you don't understand the why. But you're going to stay. Even though you don't understand what is happening, you're confused and you don't understand, you're going to stay on the mission. Can I get an amen? Even though you don't understand why, we're going to stay and we're going to continue to serve. Even though you don't understand why, we're going to continue to worship. Come on, just because you have a bad day doesn't mean you don't come to church on Sunday. That's when you come to church and we worship, even though we don't understand why. Even though we get hurt, we continue to tithe. We continue to hang in there. We don't give up. Jesus is on the cross. He could have came. The angels could have came and took him off the cross, but he hangs in there. 
This is why you and I need to hang in there. Even though we don't understand the moment. One day when you and I get to heaven, it'll make sense. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, for dying on the cross for us, absorbing all of it for us, Lord. You took it all for us, God. All you ask is for us to come to you in faith. Father, we want revival. Pray over living word this evening, God, that they would have revival. God, we, we already know that it's coming, God. We already know that it's coming. I pray that you would supernaturally, God, strengthen Pastor Fred and his wife and those that are partnering with them, Lord. That there would be honor that would flow in that ministry, God. There would be honor, God, with the leaders. And there would be honor, God, with those that serve God. God, that you would bless them, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you will never leave us or forsake us. That your word declares, God, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, God. We can come straight to you, God. So, Father, I pray, God, right now, tonight, Lord, that you would help us to work on unforgiveness. Even in myself, God, if there's unforgiveness, Lord, I pray, God, that you would set me free, God. Father, I pray that there would be those that are here tonight, God, that would get real honest, Lord, with you tonight, God. And that they would come, God, and they would be holding them back, God, and what's been holding them back from their potential. Father, I thank you for all that you're doing, God. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen.